Today's speaker is Dr. Klaus Romero. Dr. Romero is a clinical pharmacologist and epidemiologist by training with 12 years of experience in clinical research. He is a fellow of the American College of Clinical Pharmacology, a founding member of the International Society of Pharmacometrics, as well as a member of the American Society for Clinical Pharmacology and Therapeutics and the International Society for Pharmacoepidemiology. Dr. Romero has been with the Critical Path Institute since 2008, where he has led clinical pharmacology, pharmacoepidemiology, and modeling and simulation projects for the Coalition Against Major Diseases, the Polycystic Kidney Disease Outcomes Consortium, and the Critical Path to Tuberculosis Drug Regimen Consortium. He has an extensive record of publishing in the areas of clinical pharmacology, pharmacometrics, cardiovascular drug safety, and pharmacoepidemiology. And something you may not know about Klaus is that he's fluent in many languages, including English, Spanish, German, and Portuguese. Klaus, welcome to today's event. I'll now turn it over to him to begin the presentation. Excellent. Thank you, Suzanne, and thanks for the, for the invitation. Um, and thank you guys in the audience for, for being here uh, this morning. So I'd like to uh, start with uh, the acknowledgments. Um, as opposed to having them as the last slide as an afterthought. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the fact that uh, this, is a, this is a large team and these are the kinds of collaborations that we run at CPATH. So uh, Deborah is the, the head of the uh, tuberculosis consortium and then Alberg is um, a member of my team uh, and we support uh, many different consortia including this one in TB and then the SIMSIP team uh, who is actually the, the, the scientific brain behind the actual model development and uh, evaluation. And then uh, at the Gates Foundation, uh, Dave Herman and Steve Kern for their, for their support. So with that, before we start, I'd like to point out that we're going to be uh, using a, a cool uh, piece of technology for, for capturing some answers to a few questions that I that I'll pose throughout the presentation. Uh, you might want to go, if you have a, a, a smartphone, go to mentimeter.com and uh, enter the code that is on your screens. And if you want to play along, you can, uh, you know, enter your answers uh, to the questions and uh, we'll have an interactive uh, session there. So the first question is, is about your affiliation and uh, if you can uh, pick the, the affiliation that best describes your, your title, that would be great. So we have uh, somebody responded from academia, that's great, thank you. Look at that, that's really cool. Oh, look at that. So we have a pretty cool distribution of, uh, of people from academia, industry, uh, other types of organizations, and, uh, and the CRO sector. That's, uh, that's great because all of you are, are potentially target users for the model that I'll present today. So that, that's great. And thanks for, for all the responses. Look at that. It's, uh, it's still capturing answers. This is really cool, and uh, credit goes to Suzanne for, for setting this, uh, this up. Great, so uh, moving into the presentation. Uh, great, so um, if you might be asking yourself, so what, what is a Critical Path Institute? So what, what we are is essentially an organization that uh, acts as an honest broker. So what we do, uh, if you look here in the, in the center, um, what we do is provide the, the legal, scientific, and regulatory infrastructure for companies that are usually competitors out in the world to be able to come to the table and uh, in, a, in a trusted environment be able to share uh, information. And we leverage that information to generate solutions to specific bottlenecks in the drug development process for uh, different indications. And uh, we don't stop there. We uh, interface with the regulatory agencies to um, have those solutions, those drug development tools, formally reviewed and uh, potentially endorsed by those, uh, by those agencies. 
And so that's what we do. And in that context, uh, we set up a consortium uh, with, the, with funding from the Gates Foundation to essentially provide those solutions for um, tuberculosis drug development. So with that, moving on, uh, just a little bit of background on, on, on the need for a consortium uh, tackling drug development in TB. Um, so there's, there's multiple organizations, even though this is a challenging uh, environment, there's multiple organizations that are still, despite all the challenges, uh, investing in drug development uh, for TB. Uh, because this is a global problem, um, it's, the, it's the number one cause of, of death due to an infectious disease in the world. Uh, so it's, it's certainly a neglected disease, but it's not a rare disease by any stretch. So uh, it's important to, to be able to provide the, the tools for those people that are still investing in, in developing therapeutics for this, uh, for this indication. Now, the, as you can imagine, uh, TB is one of those diseases that uh, would never be uh, treated by a single drug. You need uh, drug combinations. Um, so there's, uh, there's somebody in the chat saying that they can't hear me. Can everybody hear me okay? Suzanne, can you hear me fine? Yeah, we can hear you fine. Okay. All right. Uh, so moving on, the, um, the, the challenge here is that uh, the traditional approach of expecting uh, sponsors to develop one drug at a time and then having somebody at the end of the line uh, with a crystal bowl figure out well, what's the best combination of the different uh, agents, the uh, idea here is to provide the solutions and the, and the tools so that sponsors can uh, develop the, the combinations uh, from the very beginning. And that will certainly shorten the time for, for development, and uh, that will likely help uh, tackle the, the problem of, of TB worldwide. So um, with that, that that's, uh, that's our mission statement. Um, so we want to, like I was saying, uh, develop the tools that uh, allow um, an optimized uh, drug development process for, for tuberculosis uh, combinations. And uh, we have been around since 2010, um, and uh, we have uh, the, the players in the field, which, which are not uh, a lot compared to other indications, are all uh, members of, of, the, of the initiative. And uh, it's great to have that level of, of collaboration set up. So moving into the specifics about one, one, kind, one kind of tools that we develop uh, is this notion of, of quantitative drug development platforms. So following the, the concept of modeling form drug discovery and development of uh, identifying the right pathway to identify the right druggable target, give the right drug at the right dose to the right patient in the right design, we have um, a number of active modeling and simulation efforts, everything from, from systems pharmacology to translational tools uh, to like the one I'm going to present today, physiologically based pharmacokinetic uh, models, and uh, later on clinical trial simulation tools to inform and optimize the design of uh, phase two and phase three studies. So, um, Speaking about PDPK, um, you, you already probably know this, but uh, there's been about uh, 100 label claims that have been informed by PDPK, including drug-drug interactions, uh, uh, information about absorption, um, ethnic bridging, uh, formulation, uh, special populations, uh, et cetera. And uh, that should not be ignored because that's, that's a, a testament to the direct impact that uh, model-informed drug discovery and development in general has had, but more specifically, uh, PDPK. So the model that I'm going to describe today is essentially uh, an extension of, of, the, of the platform you already know that is uh, active on the, on the SimSIP simulator. Uh, where we essentially uh, developed a, an additional set of models to capture um, the, the um, 
changes that occur as a consequence of TB in the lung and how those changes affect drug penetration into the different compartments of the lung, including the granuloma lesions. Um, virtual, uh, uh, virtual South African population that uh, allows uh, users to uh, hone into specifically the, the types of predictions that would matter in that kind of a population. And of course, a library of, uh, of compounds uh, from, from standard of care to other drugs that have been around for, for years but that are uh, looking to be potentially repurposed for, for TB, uh, like moxifloxacin, and uh, a set of, of new drugs that have been recently approved. So we try to cover the whole gamut uh, of, of, um, of potential compounds in the files. So with that, I'll, I'd like to uh, stop again and, and go to the phones. And uh, that flag that you see there is a hint to the question that I want to ask. So you can go back to Manimeter, um, and we're going to have another question. Suzanne? Yep. Great. There you go. All right. So um, the question is, um, do you think that it's true or false that uh, most of the of the studies carried out for TB drug development actually happen in South Africa? Do you think that's a true or a false statement? Ooh, fifty fifty. That's uh, that that's great. So it's, um, that, that's kind of a tricky question um, because um, there's a good number of studies that are actually carried out in, in South Africa. Um, and South Africa is a country where uh, most of the, of the sponsors go to execute clinical trials in TB, but that's not the only place. There's also studies that are, that are run in uh, Eastern Europe um, and, uh, and other places, but uh, for the purposes of of the of the need that was uh, that was expressed to CPTR by the sponsors, we went ahead and uh, developed a virtual South African population uh, because of again of the number of studies uh, for TB drug development that are carried out in South Africa. So if we can go back to the to the slides, uh, Suzanne. Yep. Great. So, um, kudos to the South African government and the and the South African academics because uh, they they have a lot of really informative census data and observational studies from which the team was able to essentially uh, get the necessary information to be able to build that virtual South African population. Everything from the age distribution to, of course, the age and height uh, distribution in order to be able to, um, also, and also height and weight, to be able to understand uh, things like body mass index and, and body surface area. Um, also, the distribution of uh, hematocrit values, and that is important to understand in TB, and you'll see why in a minute. Um, things like albumin, um, you know, pharmacokineticists um, in, the, in the room will certainly recognize the importance of protein binding to understand uh, drug distribution, and of course the genetic variations in the in the elimination um, enzymes in that particular population. So with that level of information, uh, we were able to build that that virtual South African population from which users can sample to inform clinical trial design in that specific population. Now, the added value here is that the, based on the, on the academic study, there's a lot of information to be able to include the pathophysiological changes uh, that occur in that population as a consequence, consequence of being infected with, with TB. And uh, the, the South African population is, is really special because it has, of course, um, a, a number of, of uh, individuals that are of, of quote unquote, unquote uh, pure African descent, and then they have uh, a significant mixed population, and then they also have a, a population of European descent. 
So it's important to capture that, and but also what the pathophysiological changes um, that occur that in that population, uh, especially changes in, in weight, for example, because that's going to have an impact in the in the body mass index. I mean, you may remember that one of the first names for for the disease called tuberculosis today was consumption because of the significant weight loss um, in the individuals that are affected. Um, alpha acid glycoprotein, again, albumin, important for understanding drug distribution, and the effect of TB on, on hematocrit. Um, that's, uh, that's also important, be, and, and in addition to that, the changes in pH that occur as a consequence of, of the TB infection. All things that matter uh, when you're trying to predict how drugs are going to distribute in those individuals. So with that, moving on, uh, I'm going to spend a little bit of time going through the, the components of the, of the actual permeability limited um, PK uh, model. So it's, um, as you know, the, the Simpson platform has a representation of, of the human body. Um, they had an existing lung model that was pretty comprehensive, but we took that and we expanded that model uh, to not just include all the all the subcompartments that matter to understand drug distribution into that organ, but we also went ahead and developed a a model uh, for the granuloma. And the granuloma is a is a hallmark lesion of TB infection. Um, that's where a lot of bacteria go and hide. Um, and it's critically important to understand how drugs distribute into the into the uh, granuloma. And the granuloma, just to spend a little bit of time there, has is is, is a cavity that is uh, has a rim of cells, and then in the center it has uh, necrotic material um, that, unlike other types of necrosis, um, because of the macrophages that are that are in there um, with intracellular TB. Uh, they they die in a certain way and they generate this material that is that is essentially a, a white cheesy material, hence the name casein, which means cheese. Um, and uh, it's important to understand how the drugs distribute into the subcompartments even within the granuloma. Now the the data to generate that model came from from a brilliant researcher out of Rutgers, uh, Veronique D'Artois, and if uh, somebody. Um, from her team is is on today. Please thank her again for for doing that research and being so open to share that information with us. Now back to the to why this is important. Well, because um, sure enough, you you want the drugs to uh, penetrate from the GI tract into the systemic circulation, but uh, not just that. You want the drugs to go into the lung, and not just that, you want the drugs to get into the granuloma because you want the drugs to hit the bacteria. That's kind of the point. So that's why it was uh, so critical to us to be able to develop those quantitative descriptions of um, the different compartments within the lung, including the, the granuloma. So with that, uh, we can move on to the phones for another uh, quick question. So if you can go to Mentimeter again, and Suzanne, if you can set it up. And this is kind of a, a tricky question because uh, for those of you paying attention, so I, paying attention, I haven't mentioned this, but do you think that peak glycoprotein is or should be a major component of, of this uh, PBPK model? Great, awesome, yeah. The majority of you answered that yes, and indeed it is. Um, so if we can go back to the slides, I'll, I'll start showing you some of the simulation outputs and how they compare to some of the observed uh, results clinically, and uh, we'll get to the to the peak glycoprotein part. So this is, uh, you know, for for um, rifampicin, old drug, um, staple for the treatment of TB. 
um, component of uh, the majority of regimens that are out there to treat different forms of TB. Um, it's an amphalite, as you know, so it has two pKa values. Um, it, it, had, it also has a, a, a drug-drug interaction potential that I'll cover later in the presentation. Uh, but essentially, you can see that, that for rifampin, the model adequately predicts um, what happens in terms of the, of the distribution uh, from, the, from the systemic circulation uh, into the plasma and in, into the, I'm sorry, into the epithelial lining fluid. And that's the, the ratio that you see there, the, the epithelial lining fluid to plasma uh, ratios. So um, that's uh, a starting point. Um, but then moving on, um, if you look at, at rifampin is the first example that I showed, but if you look at other drugs, I mean, you can see that in red you see the predicted uh, values and in blue the observed. And you can see that the, the model is almost on target for most of them, except for, for example, prisonamide in this case, and intraconazole here, and clarithro over here. So what's up with that? And uh, getting back to the point raised during the, during the question, let me uh, elaborate a little bit more on the, on the situation for clarithro and prisinamide. So first of all, you see that uh, for clarithro, is, it's uh, absolutely critical to understand how the pH changes um, affect the distribution of clarithro from the systemic circulation into the epithelial lining fluid. And those pH changes um, are also important to understand because as you saw before, uh, TB can actually exert changes in pH, so it's important to also be able to understand that if uh, you are to accurately predict what's gonna happen in, in uh, terms of drug distribution for that compound. Now, pyrazinamide, as you can see in the, in the bottom of the slide, uh, there's, uh, there's some active transport going on there. And so we, we had to uh, capture that because otherwise the, the predictions would be, would be wrong. Um, so um, in addition to that, there's moxie, um, not only a, a, an old drug and, and very much studied, and for those of you in the, in, in, with an interest in, in cardiovascular safety, uh, you know, third QT studies without MOXIE, that's, uh, that wouldn't, we wouldn't be today where we are if we hadn't the, the active control of MOXIE. Now, I'm not going to uh, elaborate on the, on the perceived value of, of a thorough QT study, but nonetheless, uh, MOXIE has been extensively studied. Um, but it's also uh, one of those drugs in which, sure, if you want the model to predict the systemic circulation, the model does a decent job, but since we're not supposed to stop there, um, what happens with the actual penetration of MOXIE into the epithelial lining fluid? So you can see that uh, if you only focus on the predictions uh, based on passive diffusion, you're, you're going to be off. Um, if you only uh, focus on the predictions, if you add uh, PDP, now we're talking because added, as it is known, MOXIE is a, is a substrate of PDP. But if you focus only on the, on the, on the tissue to epithelial lining fluid uh, aspects of, of PDP presence and expression, you're, you're, you're better than if you don't have that, but you're still kind of under predicting a little bit. Uh, it's only until you also account for the activity of PDP uh, for apical efflux. That's when you actually start getting more uh, accurate with, with your predictions. So back to the question, the answer is yes. Uh, for those drugs that are PDP substrates, you have to take that into account into, into the model, and MOXIE is, is an interesting case study for that. Now, uh, moving on into uh, newer drugs, uh, that's uh, uh, where we, um, I mean, for those of you in the field, you, you, you probably suspect what those drugs are. And when you get into the SimSip simulator, you'll see what those drugs are. But uh, for the purposes of this presentation, I'm just going to keep them masked a little bit. So this is uh, drug A. Um, at a specific dose, and we're looking at both the parent compound and its metabolite. So you can see that, uh, you know, the model is doing a, a decent job in predicting uh, what, uh, what's going on with, that, uh, with, with the distribution of both the parent compound and the metabolite, um, and uh, so we're pretty proud of that. 
Um, now, the in in a in a in a situation in which you're giving a, a multiple dose uh, um, regimen of that drug to a South African population, you see there that uh, you know the the how the we had two snapshots of observed data, and you see the the model predictions, and you see the, the two snapshots here. Uh, the model is over predicting a little bit. Uh, it's still within range, but it's still over predicting a little bit. Uh, that's something that uh, we're looking into. And uh, again, just to speak about the the fact that these kinds of of tools, uh, quantitative drug development platforms, need to be continuously evolving. Uh, you can't have them static. And so it's it's again back to the age old uh, paradigm of learn and confirm. Uh, drug B, another new drug at different doses, uh, it, again, in South African patients, and you can see how uh, for this drug the model uh, is, is uh, very accurate in, in predicting the, the observed uh, data. So again, we're uh, pretty proud of that. Um, and then another new drug, um, you see the predicted and the snapshot of, of what we had for that drug in terms of observed data, and you can see that the model does a decent job in predicting uh, that information. Um, so with that, I'm, I'm going to move on into another aspect of, of the model itself uh, about drug-drug interactions, which is something that, that is uh, very important uh, and a very um, critical application of PVPK models. So you see, again, back to Rufampin, um, most of you who use SimSip and who um, know PVPK might remember Rufampin as a quintessential example of, a, of an inducer. Uh, well, yes, um, but here we're, we're not just talking about the fact that it can play a role in drug drug interactions through its uh, metabolic induction activity, but it's also a drug that is used to treat TB. So, so you're, you're essentially dealing with two aspects uh, of rifampin. And you can see how um, you, the model does a decent job in, in predicting what's happening in the presence and absence of rifampin uh, for drug A uh, and its metabolites. Um, and not just to stop there, uh, drug, drugs used for TB patients are, are important, but those individuals are not just uh, using TB drugs. They, they come with a lot of comorbidities, and uh, certainly HIV is one of them. Uh, but just to make the point that we, the model was also evaluated for ketoconazole, um, in, in, you know, both in the presence or in absence of, of ketoconazole uh, for uh, the varying exposure of drug A and its metabolite. So with that, again, um, there's, a, there's a drug combination, uh, Rifeter, that is a combination of rifampin, nizanizine, and pyrazinamide in a single tablet. And uh, for drug B, you can see there how the model predicts uh, the, the um, exposure of that drug, both in the presence and the absence of um, the combination. And you can see how the, the, the effect of induction of rifampin plays a role there. Uh, so that's also important to understand when you're dealing with the with the problem of developing a model, I'm sorry, a regimen to treat TB that uh, likely needs to have rifampin as part of the part of the regimen itself. So with that, um, essentially we can we have concluded that the that the model describes the the relevant compartments uh, within the lung, including the granulomas, and I, I'm going to emphasize that again. Uh, we believe that this is significant added value uh, because that's a, that's a lesion that constitutes a hallmark of TB and is one of the most difficult parts of really uh, developing drugs against TB, being able to get into the granuloma. Um, the virtual South African population, uh, we believe, also represents an added value uh, because a lot of studies are carried out in that, in that population for drug development. Um, and for those users out there of SimSip, you, you know the different subpopulations that are already part of the, part of the menu of uh, populations that you can simulate from. Uh, this is one more, um, and you can sample from that when you use the model. Um, and it, uh, you know, it does a decent job of uh, describing drug distribution for um, 
center of care compounds, um, some of the compounds that are being studied for repurposing like uh, Moxie, and um, three new drugs. And the, the model is intended to continuously grow. There are uh, some drugs that are uh, still in development um, by, the, by the partners of the initiative. And uh, they, they are very much uh, interested in uh, partnering with, uh, with the team to provide the information to develop the compound files for those newer drugs in development. And uh, with that, I, I'd like to move to the phones again because I'm going to switch gears a little bit uh, in the presentation and talk about uh, next steps. Right, so the question is, if you happen to know uh, how the EMA reviews uh, quantitative drug development platforms that are independent from drug applications? And that might be a tricky question, but uh, it, it, I just want to steer the conversation that way. Look at that. Not many answers, but a lot of people got it right. So let's go back to the, to the slides. All right, so uh, here we go. So that's exactly what we're going to be doing now. So we're going to be discussing with the regulators um, the, the potential review and endorsement of this model as a drug development platform, uh, not attached to a specific drug application. So in the end, the end result, what we want is, is uh, a stamp of approval uh, from both EMA and FDA uh, to say that they believe that, the, that this model is robust enough and can be applied for a specific context of use in informing uh, first in human study design for uh, TB drugs. So, but we don't want to necessarily stop there. We want, and this is just an example of, of many uh, venues through which we want to uh, continue to disseminate the, the, the model and train users. So you, you are probably uh, used to the, to the training uh, seminars and, and workshops that uh, Sir Tarn Simsip uh, organize. Um, we're, working actively to generate uh, uh, specific ones about this model and include this aspect of the, of the SimSip simulator as part of the general training that they offer for the simulator itself. Uh, we want people to start using it and get feedback, um, both the good, the bad, and the ugly, uh, so that we can get a sense for uh, areas for improvement. And I just want to call attention to the fact that uh, we at CPATH have a strategic MOU with ISOP, uh, and we are creating this concept of the communities of practice. So what we want to do is set up uh, fora for users of, of different uh, tools. You're probably aware of the, of the existence of fora for, for uh, non-MIM and other types of tools. We want to do the same for uh, drug development tools that, that we and others have developed uh, through collaborative efforts. And so, <clears throat> just to talk about the, the regulatory piece a little bit. Um, so we, we kind of spearheaded the, the, the process that is now uh, quote unquote official at FDA for the review and potential endorsement of quantitative drug development platforms. Uh, it's called the Fit for Purpose Initiative. So for FDA, it's not called qualification. Uh, so far, there have been two decisions uh, issued uh, one, the first one was uh, from one of our consortia, and uh, kudos to, to Brian Corrigan and other partners from Pfizer. Um, he co-chaired the team with me who developed the first uh, clinical trial simulator that was put through that uh, review process. It's a clinical trial simulator for Alzheimer's disease to optimize design of phase two and phase three studies. And then came a MCP mod, who you may also uh, know uh, this um, collaborative effort uh, from Novartis and J&J &J for dose optimization phase two. 
so those are the, the two decisions uh, thus far, and uh, potentially uh, the, the PBPK model for TB could be the third one. So uh, stay tuned for updates on that front. Now, as you know, this, this is, again, a testament to the importance of PBPK. Uh, FDA issued a guidance late, late last year, and they had an advisory committee meeting in March uh, focused on one of the two things that they discussed was uh, PBPK during that uh, advisory committee meetings. And, and so that, that just speaks to the importance of, of PBPK in drug development. And PBPK being an example of, of a quantitative drug development approach, um, we at CEEP have uh, clearly see the value of that, and we certainly want to potentially spearhead uh, more and more conversations about the development of PBPK models uh, expanded for other areas and indications um, in both infectious diseases and other areas. Now, speaking about EMA, and that was the nature of the question that I, that I asked, uh, so there, there, you see two guidance documents there. One uh, is the, the guidance that EMA issued um, last year again, in the summer of last year, on PVPK, and they also had a public meeting um, the week of Thanksgiving, I think, last year. And that spearheaded a lot of conversation about the, the, you know, the differences between the FDA and EMA guidance documents. Uh, but the more important thing is that that guidance from uh, EMA actually links to another guidance document. And that's not necessarily uh, apparent at first glance. That, that PBPK guidance links to another guidance that preceded this one. And that's the, the guidance on the qualification of novel methodologies for drug development. That's the mechanism that EMA uses to review and quote unquote qualify uh, drug development tools of many different kinds, including um, quantitative drug development platforms like uh, PBPK. And in the PBPK guidance, there's a specific uh, link to that guidance for the potential review and qualification of, of PBPK models through the qualification of novel methodologies and drug development mechanism that EMA has. And we're also um, in conversations with, with EMA uh, for the potential review and, and potential endorsement of, of this uh, model as a, as a drug development tool. Now, as you can imagine, the, the first thing we need to, we need to uh, have clear with both agencies is the intended context of use uh, statement. So that's essentially the, a clear description of what the tool is supposed to do. You can think of that as uh, the, the label, quote unquote, for the drug development tool. And that has to be very clear, and that's what, uh, what drives the, the regulatory review. So with that uh, um, detour into regulatory science, I'll conclude the presentation, and I'll take any, any questions uh, from the audience. And again, thanks, Suzanne, for setting it up, and thank you for adopting that uh, technology of Mendimeter, um, that, was, that was fun. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Klaus. Um, we'd like to invite our audience to ask um, your questions to Dr. Romero. You can, you can submit them through the, the Q&A box. So, looks like our first question from the audience was um, speaking to the fact that the South African population is, is very diverse, and they wanted to know whether you consider different subpopulations within the South African population, um, like sub, you know, African, people of European descent, people of mixed descent. That's an excellent question. So the, the data that were used to develop the virtual South African population have, have the mixture embedded in it. Uh, now, the, the current version of the population has everything in. Um, and what you sample from when you use the tool includes that level of variation. Um, now, the next step, uh, is to actually drill deeper into the, the data from the South African population and uh, explore if, if uh, those uh, differences um, have a significant impact, and, and if so, link that back to the uh, likelihood of the different subpopulations of actually enrolling in TB studies and uh, take that to the next level of, of, the, of the model. Again, back to the, the whole concept of, of learn and confirm. 
But uh, yeah, that's the answer. I, I hope that that answered the question. Someone would like to know, what did you find to be the biggest limitation of the SimSip simulator during the project? Right, that is another very good question. So there's um, one, let me, let me, um, let me let me make the following statement. One of the things that uh, that we found in the process was the fact that uh, there's there's this mindset that uh, PBBK can be viewed as a mechanistic type of model, and that's largely true. However, uh, this links back to the data availability. When you have certain pieces of information that don't constitute the full mechanistic explanation for certain things, you have to go not too mechanistic with the model, if that makes sense. So let me give you an example, the PGP aspect. Um, do we know for sure the mechanistic um, information about the actual uh, gene expression for PGP in all the tissues in the lung? Well, the answer is no. However, um, we can build the, the model in such a way that allows for the inclusion of PDP activity into the model to help improve the predictions. Now, that doesn't necessarily link back to, the, to an absolute 100% validated knowledge about the expression, so it's not 100% mechanistic, but it's still a, 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 uh, an adequate explanation. So one of the one of the things that we found throughout the process is that that potentially, and this links back to the conversation with regulators, uh, we we need to start um, disabusing people of this notion that that PBBK modeling is is a purely mechanistic thing, because it it's it's not necessarily. I hope that answered the question. Someone would like you to provide a, a brief overview of the specific input parameters to simulate the granuloma KCM distribution of a, of a given anti-tuberculosis drug. Right, very good question. So um, let, me, let me just make a clarification there. So, for, so those drugs for which we have information of their distribution into the granulomas, are the drugs that have been studied by the team at Rutgers. So it's not all the drugs that you'll see in the, in the compound library that have underlying information for you to be able to take them all the way into the casium and the granuloma. It's limited to, to uh, some drugs. One example is rifampin, you know, the HL drug. Uh, so what they, what they have done in their studies is, is essentially imaging uh, through radio, radio labeling for drug distribution into the into the casium. So you essentially apply the same kind of standard fluid dynamics um, and the parameters for the distribution into the casium based on the uh, data that have been generated by the Rutgers investigators. But it's not for all the drugs. One thing that they're doing is they're generating additional data for uh, additional drugs and we're Looking forward to getting those data to be able to incorporate that information into the model. So it, so it sounds like um, you use the radio imaging to uh, assign the mass or volume of the granulomas to an individual. Is that right? Right. So, so we we know. So it's a combination of things. So we we have the imaging data from the from the from the patients, and you know to understand what the what the components and the you know dissection of of uh, post-morning examinations to understand how it, a, a granuloma is, is um, the, the anatomical structure of the granuloma, if you will. Um, but then to understand what, what are the, what are the, like the, you know, uh, passive diffusion uh, constants and those kinds of things and, and PKA values and that kind of stuff for, for the drugs that uh, penetrate into the granuloma, there's, uh, we're relying on the imaging data from the Rutgers investigators. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think, I think so. So, so um, someone wanted to know, if once you have that, that data, that imaging data, they wanted to know um, how much those, those values for the, the mass or the volume of the granulomas varies over the population. 
Oh, that's an excellent question. Yeah, so <laughs> we don't necessarily have that much of a detailed information there for the current version of the model. One of the things that, that uh, let me just make this other comment. In the, in, to follow the paradigm of learn and confirm, we've come across certain gaps like that one, for example. We, we don't have that level of detail in the model. So one of the things that we're linking back with the, with the experimentalists is to, to spearhead a conversation for the perspective generation of that additional data to be able to account for the actual, quote unquote, uh, more reliable progression uh, parameters of the granuloma lesions and what are the source of variability because not every single patient that gets infected with TB ends up developing granulomas and that's also important to understand and we don't necessarily have a lot of reliable data to actually develop a, a model that describes that in a reliable way. We'd love to have those but we, we don't have that yet so that's a, that's a conversation that we're having again with the with people like the Gates Foundation, et cetera, to, to um, be able to have that conversation about funding, those kinds of studies prospectively generate that, that, that information to link that back into the model. Someone from the audience would like to know what, the plan, what your plan is to extend the model for the mechanism of action assessment and predictions? Yes. That, that, that's, uh, that's also part of the plan. So the, the pharmacodynamic aspect uh, component is also critically important. Um, but, you know, reality is that we don't, we don't have unlimited resources. So we have to start somewhere. And this is the first version of, of this platform. And the plan is to grow this platform to include additional information, especially around the pharmacodynamics linking that to uh, clinical trial findings. And one of the things that, that uh, is also part of the, of the CPTR uh, initiative, CPAP has a collaboration with uh, the Gates Foundation and the World Health Organization where we have set up a database that uh, integrates the, the data, the patient level data from three pivotal clinical trials uh, that looked at uh, a shortened regimen of four months, including fluoroquinolones. Um, now, sadly, those, those three studies didn't meet the non-inferiority endpoint, so, so they are quote-unquote failed trials, but they, that uh, set of trials has a lot of information, and we have integrated the patient-level information into a, into a single platform that is publicly available, and, uh, you know, for those of you interested in accessing that, uh, just shoot me an email and I'll point you in the direction to, to fill out the application form. Uh, but suffice it to say that we're planning to link potentially the, this uh, model with clinical trial findings from that platform and also the, the trials that preceded those uh, phase three studies, so the phase two information, which we're also gathering to be able to link that uh, you know, from start to finish in the in the drug development process to see uh, if the the potential pharmacodynamic predictions that we will eventually include in the model actually link to uh, observed results in phase two and phase three studies. So it's ongoing work. For some drugs, the effect of pH on the pharmacokinetics is anticipated based on on its physiochemical properties. For clarithromycin, was the pH effect linked to the solubility differences across physiologically relevant across the physiologically relevant pH range? Yes. Yeah, that the answer is yes. Someone would like to know: Can the absorption component of the PBPK model predict or explain food effects, including the varying effects of different kinds of food? Right. So. Yeah, very good question. So um, the the SimSIP platform itself has a component for that, for the food effect. And what you would do now is essentially make use of that uh, when you're setting up these simulations. Now, doesn't necessarily mean that you, you'll have the underlying data for all the TB drugs, and again, especially some of the newer drugs. 
and that's uh, those are pieces of, of data that we're also trying to integrate into the model. So it's it's what you have right now as part of the of the already captured food effects in the Simpson platform, uh, but we're looking to expand that to also account for specific data for the for the for for TB drugs, especially the new ones. One of our audience members uh, is making a comment about the work at Rutgers. They're saying that uh, studies are also being done with microdialysis to measure drugs in cavitory lesions. Yes, uh, that, that's true. And uh, there's a, there's a really great study, um, and there's uh, you know there's also a, a component of this that links back to the University of Florida. Uh, they they are also involved in a in a really great study in in Georgia, the the country, not the state. Um, where they're where they're doing that in 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 patients in TB patients quote unquote real world uh, TB patients so those those data are going to prove extremely valuable for drugs that were withdrawn decades ago not much PPPK data is available how do you think the SimSip simulator can be used to model toxicity using the existing data oh great question great question so. Um, let me let me start by saying that one of the one of the goals uh, of of integrating the the data from the phase three studies is is the fact that those three phase three studies that I mentioned have uh, this essentially the same control arm uh, with the the standard of care combination that includes all the old drugs you know rifampicin, methamphetamine, uh, prisinamide, etc. Um, and as Robust phase three clinical studies. They they captured uh, safety data, and uh, with the added value of being able to integrate the patient level information across three control arms that were exposed to the same regimen, um, one of the goals is to um, perform a model based analysis of the safety components of the standard of care arm. Um, so that we better understand what's the safety benchmark for the uh, age-old combination of standard of care. On top of the already known uh, information about liver toxicity, et cetera. And then link that back to exposure measures more reliable in TB patients for those uh, standard of care drugs. Once you have that, you can you can have a benchmark for the relationship between exposure levels and uh, safety signals, so the adverse events, right? And so and if you have the information about exposure uh, through the PBBK uh, platform, then you can link the two, right? So at a at a specific level of exposure that I that I'm aiming for for efficacy, linked in the in the PBBK model. What's the relationship of that to the to be generated relationship between exposure and safety signals in a robust uh, uh, phase three setting? So I hope that that answers the question. He talks about population characteristics that affect uh, pharmacokinetics. Have you detected any population characteristics that, that might also impact pharmacodynamics? Oh yeah, great, great question. So that, yeah, that that goes back to uh, this whole notion of expanding the the pharmacodynamic component and expanding the 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 impact of the population uh, file. Um, le let me just uh, make make another comment, and this is not not going to be surprising uh, to this audience, but but nonetheless, it's an important finding. Um, in looking at the at the at the integration of phase three data, uh, one of the main uh, factors for so let me let me put that into context. So the the shortened regimen that was being evaluated, the four month uh, duration regimen versus a six month uh, duration regimen. Even though the trials did not meet the non inferiority benchmark, uh, there was clearly um, saw populations in the four month treatment that actually benefited from that regimen. And we're looking at, in a, in a model-based meta-analysis kind of way, for the uh, factors that, that drive that. 
And one of the, of, the, of the factors that we have found is actually exposure uh, influenced by adherence. And one of the things that uh, is just reality today for programmatic settings of treating TB patients is the fact that this uh, directly observed therapy in which the patient has to go to a specific venue where a health professional supervises the patient taking the actual doses of the drugs is, is a good idea on the surface to maintain adherence, but there's a logistical problem. The reality is that those centers close during the weekends, and the patients are not allowed to take any doses home. So they essentially stop for the weekend doses, and they come back Monday to restart treatment. And that turns out to have a significant effect in pharmacodynamics. So again, nothing surprising to this audience about exposure, but um, there, there's, there's certainly an adherence component that needs to be figured out in the field, while at the same time we're exploring certain additional population aspects that may affect pharmacodynamics um, that relate to exposure as well, like the, like the variability in the genetic uh, enzymes for elimination, for example, um, and uh, the, the comorbidities as well. So, yeah. We only have time for one final final question, but we can we can likely email um, our audience members answers to the rest of the questions. Um, Klaus, when you when you talk about the virtual South African population, is that only adults, or does that include children as well? Oh, great question. So yeah, we're we're limited to adults. Um, the the remit of 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 the first iteration of CPTR as a collaborative effort. Um, it was decided that we should focus on adults, uh, adults with pulmonary TB. So we're not uh, dealing yet with pediatric populations or with extra pulmonary TB. So yeah, that's that's one of the limitations. Yes. Thank you so much, Klaus, for that uh, wonderful and, and very educational presentation.